Um, okay, so now that we've kind of gotten to this point where I'm consistent with the mini hack topology, as I mentioned, what I'd like to get into now is let's continue to use this uh, this Ubuntu device as a, a server to configure other additional things. Um, so realize the day of the competition, you're probably going to be given multiple computers where each one will be its own server responsible for different stuff. Uh, with, with our mini hack topology here, we're kind of just being efficient. We're just going to use one box and configure it to be multiple different servers all at the same time. So it's going to be a web server and it's going to be other servers as well. Um, okay, so let, let's let's see what I'd like to get into here next. And uh, that, that's going to be on our Ubuntu machine. I'd like to also, so that we've got our website online, I've got my IP address online, that's great. I'd also like to configure this to be an SSH server. So SSH is a really important service when we're talking about security, uh, when we're talking about just being a professional in cybersecurity. Security. When you're talking about networking, how can I connect to something else remotely, securely? Like SSH is one of our go-to tools. So this is why we oftentimes learn about SSH in our classes. And so I'd like us to make sure that we know using a Linux computer, whether it's Ubuntu or Kali or CentOS, like let's make sure we can understand some of the finer details of how SSH actually works in practice. Now, I think one of the most important things to understand is going to be just similar to before, do I have an SSH service installed already? It's like, uh, I, I don't know. Like, I, I got this computer. I didn't set this up, right? So whenever you get a computer for the first time, you should be very curious about what's actually installed on this computer. Do I have to install this stuff, or is this stuff already here? And so many times I'm, I'm emphasizing that we oftentimes start with something like checking the status, right? We could do something like a system CTL status, and then it's like, well, what's the name of the service? And the name of the course of our service is oftentimes SSH. On our sent computers, you might find that... Uh, you could do it by doing a system CTL status SSHD. SSHD, that might be another way that you could go and check to see the status of the service. And you actually see, like, we do have one installed right now. Our Ubuntu computer right now has system CTL status SSH or SSHD. The command actually works both uh, for Ubuntu. It says open BSD secure shell server. So it does have one and it's actually running. So, oh, okay, I, I guess I didn't even have to, to start this. Um, so where, where, where are the configuration files? I didn't even realize that this was a server that was already running on this computer. So it's good to realize what are some of the services that are running before you even got there. All right. And so uh, what, what I'd like to explore here as we do this is to realize that just like many other services, the configuration files, they're usually found somewhere inside ETC. Right. We were looking at slash ETC slash Apache uh, when we were exploring the web server. Um, so, yeah, when we're dealing with SSH, we have an SS, uh, slash ETC slash SSH folder. So let's go there. I'm going to go to a CD to uh, over to slash ETC slash SSH. Right? And I'm going to do an ls inside this folder and just take a look. Be like, oh, okay, I've got, I've got a folder, slash etc, slash ssh, and I've got some important things, I guess, like uh, configuration files. Hey, dot, it's underscore config. Right? I've got an sshd underscore config. I've got a bunch of these files called keys, like key, something called dot pub. Like, okay, so there, there's some important configuration files here. And definitely, if we wanted to learn how to securely, again, securely set up an SSH server, you want to have a good understanding of what these files are and how these work, as well as a few others that can show up in other locations. Um, so why don't we just sort of explore the initial configuration file, All right? So let's take a look at this. So um, I, I, I don't want to make any changes. If you wanted to make changes, you'd have to open these with sudo. But maybe for now, I'll just use something like nano and just go into the file, right? So I could do a nano of slash etc, slash ssh, slash ssh underscore config, right? Sure, let's take a look at one of the initial config files. And it says, hey, this is unwritable because I didn't open it with sudo. That's okay. I don't actually want to make any changes to these right now, All right? But as you kind of read through some of these configuration files, they will give you details as to what is this configuration file and why should you care about it. Now, this first one here, this ssh underscore config, you can kind of see a lot of this stuff seems to be commented out. It doesn't seem to have all that much information. Um, some things I'd like to kind of draw to our attention first. Now, number one, of course, is this is a file that has an include include statement, right? And I, I mentioned this before with Apache, that anytime you do, you're doing these configuration files, you're going to want to start paying close attention to which ones have includes, because that means this configuration file does not work by itself. We're including other configuration files. So anything is telling us right here, anything that's located in ssh underscore config dot D 
that will also be included as part of how your SSH currently runs. So it's like, oh, well, that, that's kind of good to know that this thing isn't working by itself. There could be other files that you might want to go and check. Um, a lot of this information is also commented out, but just, just realize that just because it's commented out doesn't mean that it's not working or doesn't mean that it doesn't apply. Um, there's a lot of information in a lot of our configuration files where there is a default. And so the default is assumed and the default is actually written into these configuration files and commented out. But the point is that if you wanted to override the default configuration and do something else instead of how SSH is programmed from the start, then what you could do is you could come down to one of these lines uncomment the line and then change what do you want this setting to be and so when you look at this file it's like well there, there's kind of a there's kind of a bunch of settings here it's like well yeah yeah there are there certainly are a lot of ways that you could tweak the security of your ssh server and i certainly don't pretend that we're going to go through and understand all of them here today um, but certainly i'd like us to start to get used to uh, a, a couple of them uh, just just to see what they're all about so that's one file that's the ssh underscore config file um, the other one I want us to look at is the sshd underscore config file. This, this, this is another really good one to know about, uh, uh, slash etc, slash ssh, sshd underscore config. Let's take a quick look at this one. So again, like before, you see there's an include statement, so we're including other things. But you'll notice this one, the sshd file, this file is actually quite a bit longer. It's longer and it has more options in here, which again, remember, we're inheriting a lot of defaults, but if you wanted to change a lot of the uh, way your SSH server is currently programmed to behave, this is a really good file to know about. It probably has some value in here where you could come in here, uncomment the, the default and be able to say, yes, this is how I want this variable or this functionality to now behave instead. Um, let, let's make it tangible. Let's talk about a couple of, of what you might want might want to take a look at. So something like the port. SSH, as you might have learned from a networking class, it runs on port 22. And so, yeah, this is something that is default into, uh, into our uh, SSH configuration. If I wanted to change this, I would have to open this file with sudo. I would have to uncomment this line and say, well, we're going to explicitly use port 22, or we're going to explicitly use some other port that I type in here. Now, certainly a lot of networking concepts kick in real quick. If you start using other ports, are you going to conflict with another service? Um, is your routing actually paying attention to that port and uh, looking on the So you got to be real careful and really, uh, you know, uh, act with purpose if you're going to be changing the ports. You don't want to just come in here and randomly change the ports. But if we're not interested in operating on a different port, then I can just leave that the way it is. I don't have to make any changes, and that's the way my SSH server is going to behave. Um, you'll also see there's a line here for listen address. So your uh, SSH uh, service, the thing that's installed on this computer, will run on a specific IP address. Unless, of course, if you have the listen address here of, you know, 0 .0 .0 .0, 0.0.0.0, right? If you leave this line uh, uncommented or commented out, then, then realize what will happen is your SSH server will actually listen on any IP address. So right now, because I'm not specifying, I don't have this uncommented, and I'm not specifying one specific IP address. Like, what is my IP address right now on this machine? I could specify like 192.168.8.2 and say, no, this is the only IP address that my SSH server will actually go and listen on. It's like, the, 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 what, what do you want to do? Do you want to force your SSH server to only listen on one IP address? Or do you want to listen on any IP address that you might possibly be assigned? Right, so maybe I'll change it back to that 0, .0, .0, 0.0.0.0. Now, you might be sitting there going, well, you know, James, what, what does it really matter? And it's like, well, you know, in, in, some, in some ways, it, it might not matter, right? So I'll do a control XN and say, remember, my, my IP address right now, I only had one. I only had the 192.168.8.2. That was the only address that I actually had. But what if I had other addresses, right? What if this was a device that was actually connected to multiple networks all at the same time, more similar to like my router? Do you want your SSH server to listen and allow connections coming from some other network? Like maybe you do, maybe you don't. So this is a way that you can control how your SSH server listens and what are the types of things that you're actually listening for. Um, another uh, another uh, common thing here that we want to start paying attention to, we're going to get into keys here in just a moment. So these are going to be some really important files here to understand. Uh, one last one that I want to uh, kind of draw our attention to. Um, there is an option down here called permit root login. 
permit root login currently uh, currently uncommented um, and you can see here it has a value of like prohibit password now this is uh, hopefully pretty self-explanatory do you want your SSH server to allow the root user to go and log in as and on many systems you might uncomment this and say well I'm not going to allow this at all I don't want the root user account to ever be logged into so maybe I would uncomment this and say permit root login no this is not something that I want a root user, uh, the, the root user to be able to log into. Um, as you kind of saw before, it had uh, prohibit password, which means you would have to set up key authentication, which again, we'll get into that kind of in a future video. But um, I could say, well, actually, yes, maybe the root user is one of the only people who could log into this. And so I might change this to permit root login and, and make that be yes. All right. Again, this is something I'm not interested in changing right now, but I'm trying to draw our attention to some of the critical options that you really should understand from the bottom up as we go about uh, uh, understanding more about our SSH server. So I'll hit my control X and then say N. I don't want to save any of my changes, right? Bottom line, we've got this location slash ETC slash SSH, and you want to start paying attention, especially to this SSHD underscore config. But you also have to kind of pay attention to what else is in these other configuration files and what else is in these other configuration folders. Did, did anybody toss in an extra configuration file, which is actually changing the way your SSH server behaves? You know, people, the sneaky people can start doing sneaky things and by sneaky of course I mean malicious so we want we want to be careful with that um, okay, so uh, my SSH server is running maybe what I'll uh, try to just do right now would be well how can I test it how can I test to see can someone actually connect to my SSH server and of course that's why I brought our internal Kali machine online so let's go back over to the internal Kali I'll wake this guy back up we'll log back in here and say hey I could ping Right, I could ping this this internal website. Right, I could ping my 192.168.8.2 from the Kali. Can I connect securely using the SSH server that's located at the Ubuntu computer? I don't know. Let's give it a try. How do you do it? So the quick answer would be you can type out SSH to establish an SSH connection. You would then say who do you want to log in as? Right. So I could say well I want to log in to the Ubuntu computer using the user sandbox and it's important to understand the reason why i'm picking sandbox is not because sandbox is a user here on this side it's because sandbox is a possible user on the ubuntu side you're logging into that computer you need to log into a user account that's on that computer so sure i'll say ssh space sandbox and then i would use the at symbol to say at so i'm logging in user at and then you would normally put the ip address or the domain name if it was something like sandbox at my you know you could do that and dns would go and resolve that we of course don't have that up and running just yet so we're going to type in the ip address so i'll say sandbox at and then i want to log into 192.168.8.2 so this is a way i can try to establish a secure connection right here in the terminal and go log into the other computer not because i'm running an ssh server here but because i'm running an ssh server on the ubuntu computer okay let's give it a try it says hey i've never seen this computer before do I want to accept this fingerprint? Do I want to accept this information that the server is giving to me? It's like, well, yeah, I trust this server, so I'll say yes. All right, and it's going to say, okay, well, prove that you know the sandbox user's password. It's like, oh, well, okay, that's just, just password. I can do that. P A S S W R D. Right, it hides the characters, but it doesn't. It is indeed typing. And then, of course, it gives you the welcome message. Welcome, you're now accessing the Ubuntu computer. And then, of course, it kind of changes the color on you a little bit to show, hey, you're you're actually accessing another computer right now. It's like, oh, okay. Can can I can can I confirm that? Like, where am I? How would I do a PWD? Right? You can see it dropped you into the slash home slash sandbox directory. It's like, well, I'm, I'm now running commands on the other computer. Right? I could do something like an IPA. Right? IPA. I now check the IP address, not of my computer, but of the Ubuntu computer. And so this is why paying attention to who am I currently logged in as in this terminal and which computer am I logged in as in this terminal becomes the important things to pay attention because I'm no longer running commands on my Kali machine. I'm now running commands on the server. So if I were to do something like, I don't know, how about check the netplan file slash etc slash netplan, right? And then we had that 01 network manager, right? This is not a file that's on Kali. This is a file that's on the Ubuntu side. It's like, well, there it is. 
I could see it. I could actually go into this file and reconfigure the file and mess with the file. I'm logged in as the sandbox user remotely in a secure fashion. Right? And so that's, of course, the power of SSH. This is why we love setting up SSH servers and being able to connect to them remotely as administrators. This allows me to have the ability to run commands on a computer that I don't have to be next to. Because when you think about this from a network perspective, I mean, that, that Ubuntu computer, that could be on the other side of the country. Right? I could be here in New York and that Ubuntu computer can be in ca in California and, and I could still go remotely connect to it and I don't need to physically ne be, be near the computer anymore. So this is, this is, of course, why we need to be able to learn how to do this uh, for, for remote management in a secure fashion. Um, okay, when I'm, when I'm all done after I've uh, done this, may maybe to prove that I was actually here, maybe I'll make a file, right? Maybe I'll make a, I'll do a touch. Callie was, was here, something like that. Just something silly to prove like, yes, I'm here. Yes, I can run commands. I just made a file here in the home directory, right? So if I come back over here and say something like ls of tilde, right? If I look in the home directory, it's like, hey, there was. They're now running commands as this user account kind of logged in remotely. Okay, um, now when I'm all done with my SSH work, it becomes also important to know how do I terminate the connection? So after you're all done, I don't need to be logged in as this user anymore. We've got the exit command. All right, so I can just type exit and that will log me out of my current user session and go back to my previous user session, which was the sandbox session locally here on the Kali machine. All right, and so, hey, there we go. There's the basics of establishing an SSH connection. We had to make sure the server was on. We had to make sure the server was listening on an acceptable IP address. We saw that it was listening on, uh, on any IP address that was assigned. The service was already running. We didn't even have to start it. So that, that, that connection path was available all the way from the moment of us turning on our Ubuntu computer on that side. So good, good things to kind of realize and, and understand how I can securely uh, remotely go and connect to a computer.